Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome you all again for the 30-hour certificate course on drafting, pleading, and convincing organized by School of Law, Fairfield Institute of Management and Technology mm -hmm. under the aegis of IQSE and in collaboration with Pro Bono Club. Today, we have with us our esteemed speaker, Mr. R.H. Sikandar from Module uh, 8, who shall be speaking on the topic, convincing. R.H. Sikandar is an advocate on record in the Supreme Court of India. He also practices in the High Court of Delhi and various other tribunals. He is a standing counsel for Delhi Commission for Protection of Child Rights, mm -hmm. legal consultant for Delhi Police and consultant at, uh, at NHRC. He's also an adjunct faculty at various law schools in India. His core areas of practice include constitutional law, criminal law, economic offenses, counter uh, insurgency law, etc. Sir is regularly invited by various department, organizations, and law schools and universities across the country to conduct legal workshops and trainings and speak on different topics. I welcome you, sir, for today's lecture. Good evening, all. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you so good much, Swati. Uh, thank you for a generous introduction. A very good evening to everyone. Uh, I think uh, you all are at an advanced uh, stage of uh, this certificate course of 30 hours, and a lot of topics, as I could see from the brochure, must have been covered by now. And uh, the module which I have been assigned is uh, the conveyancing, and it involves certain, though there are many instruments. Uh, by which uh, conveyancing of property is done. But uh, I've been assigned to speak on certain key instruments. But uh, before we actually proceed to the uh, to those instruments and what are the nuances of drafting those instruments, I would first briefly introduce you to uh, what is conveyancing. Uh, most of you may be already aware and those who are not or are understanding that uh, conveyancing, uh, it's an art by which you know, drafts are drafts and documents uh, are uh, you know made uh, which convey any right, title, or interest generally in immobile property. But there are certain instruments which are called conveyance deeds as well, uh, which uh, involve movable property. But mostly, uh, these conveyance deeds pertain to the uh, immobile property. Uh, so any document by which any right, title, or interest in an immobile property is transferred from one person to another, uh, this expression is commonly called conveyancing. So it involves drafting of uh, various instruments, what can be uh, collectively termed as conveyance deeds. Now, uh, before we actually go to the module and the actual, uh, you know, the instruments, uh, so, so there are certain basic things when it comes to uh, drafting of any instrument. Uh, uh, one of them being, uh, understanding the law revol revolving the instrument which we are supposed to which we are asked to draft and uh, uh, these days we uh, you know a lot of times uh, we uh, quickly try to navigate through the formats or samples available on google or the internet but uh, uh, i should add a word of caution here that uh, that is not the correct way to go about things say uh, we are going to discuss about partnership deed or a relinquishment deed or a gift deed, all these instruments you may find if you uh, put a Google search, you will find a lot of samples of these uh, documents online. Though there are certain boilerplate clauses which may be used, but uh, it's not, uh, these instruments are not a kind of, you know, uh, 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 it is not something which we can term as one size fits all. That's why these are all, uh, they should be custom tailored and uh, uh, keeping in view the requirements of, uh, the parties and what they intend to convey, um, as well as the law revolving these documents. So we start with the partnership deed. Now, uh, I don't know how many of you have uh, gone through the Partnership Act of 1932. That is the law which governs the partnerships. Though we have limited liability partnerships act as well, that, is, that was much later, that was in 2008. But uh, traditionally partnership firms are governed by the part Indian Partnership Act of 1932. Now, before we go into you know drafting of any uh, partnership deed, it's very important. Uh, though we don't have much time today to go into the nuances of the partnership law, but there are certain uh, you know uh, provisions of law which we need to understand. So the first thing being 
before we embark upon uh, dropping uh, any... yeah, somebody is saying something. All yes, right. sir, you can continue. Thank you. So uh, before we embark upon drafting any uh, document, uh, we need to uh, understand the law revolving it, it not just the uh, the statute uh, as uh, apart from the statute, we need to know the latest judgments on the same as well, because a lot of the times the law is clarified or crystallized by way of some judgments. So when it comes to partnership uh, deed, I was uh, referring to the Indian Partnership Act of 1932. Now, what Partnership Act does, it provides, you know, it details out what is a partnership firm, who are partners, there are key definitions given, what are their rights, what are their liabilities, whether, uh, you know, the partnership firm is to be registered or not, or what are the effects of non-registration. There are a lot of uh, rights and liabilities defined in the Act itself. So I won't be going into each and every one of them, but broadly, once uh, we have to, uh, we have undertaken the task of, uh, you know, uh, drafting a partnership deed, it's imperative that we go through the act first, uh, rather than just putting it on the Google and getting a, a you know, sample from somewhere. Uh, one may find many, as I was telling you, uh, but I don't think so that's the correct approach to go about it because uh, maybe your clients uh, may be uh, needing something in particular and instead of we getting some standard format and just putting the names of parties and uh, you know uh, conveying it forward. That is not the way. Initially, it may work, but ultimately when the disputes arise, that's the whole point. Why do you have uh, instruments in writing and uh, sometimes which are compulsorily to be registered as well? The idea is if and when any dispute arises, uh, the parties are very clear about the terms of it. There is no ambiguity. The, uh, the clauses in that instrument are absolutely clear, are not vague. That is one of the key points one needs to remember. Irrespective of the document or the deed we are drafting, uh, certain basics, I'm sure that these things have been talked about in the earlier modules as well, that whenever we draft something, we should be able to convey the intent of the parties who are uh, the you know parties to that document or the deed. So those things have to be kept in mind. Simple language may be used. And uh, what if as lawyers we are uh, asked to you know vet such documents or to draft such documents we need to first gather what parties intend to convey and we may advise them accordingly keeping in view what is the law prevailing so to start with the partnership deed now it's a form of business as most of us would be knowing that uh, you know one may carry on uh, start a business in our country by way of various modes one is the sole proprietorship where is where one is uh, you know, the only one person is the runs the show, and whenever there are one or more 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 than one persons, so uh, and they intend to carry on a business, they may adopt the uh, you know uh, the nomenclature of a partnership and the requirements as laid down under the partnership, and it has its own advantages uh, as are laid down in the Partnership Act itself. Now, as and when anyone wants to you know start a business by way of partnership there of course there have to be more than two persons two or more than two uh, depends there is no limit in the act how many partners can be there in the business now for smooth functioning of uh, you know the partnership firm it is uh, imperative the partnership can be oral as well uh, as for the partnership act itself it provides that it is not necessary that partnership uh, needs to be in writing uh, but we all know uh, as lawyers as students of law what are the advantages of having something in writing? Uh, you know, the, if we go into the whole concept of uh, putting something in writing, the idea is multifold. Uh, it has a lot of benefits. Firstly, it avoids conflicts. It is, you know, uh, uh, for smooth running of any uh, organization or a firm, it uh, serves as a ready reckoner. What are the rights and liabilities of partners uh, or the persons who are running it, who are parties to such document? And... Uh, what are they supposed to do? What are their functions? What are their duties? What are their liabilities in case of any contingency or any untoward incident as well? So uh, now a partnership deed in particular, though I told you that uh, some uh, businesses may require certain clauses. So there is no particular format for a partnership deed, but there are certain clauses which should be compulsorily included in a partnership deed. And those are the clauses I'll be talking about in particular. As I said, first go through the Partnership Act, see what do the what does the law say as of now, so that 
मम्मी गेट बंद कर रहे हैं अंशिता यू मे म्यूट योर सेल्फ सो इट शुड नॉट बी अगेंस्ट द प्रिवेलिंग लॉ एंड दैट्स वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सो टिपिकली अ पार्टनरशिप डीड वुड फर्स्टली इंट्रोड्यूस द पार्टीज हाउ मेनी यू नो पार्टीज आर देयर सो एंड सो डीड इज मेड एट सो एंड सो प्लेस फ्रॉम इट विल इन इंडिकेट द डेट ऑफ बिगिनिंग ऑफ पार्टनरशिप देन इट मे टॉक अबाउट कंपलसरीली इन द फर्स्ट प्लेस व्हाट इज द बिजनेस अबाउट इन द रिसाइटल्स इटसेल्फ वेयर एज सो एंड सो has uh, you know joined together to run a business whichever uh, you know uh, the kind of business it may be it may be a manufacturing it may be selling of goods it may be selling things on commission it may be providing for some services whatever the nature of business is that may be mentioned in the deed then the uh, name of the firm is very important that they'll conduct these partners these persons will be conducting business under the name and style of whatever name they may have chosen of course it shouldn't you know infringe upon the ip or of any third party uh, that keeping in mind that otherwise there may be claims later on that you are running a deceptively similar kind of business uh, whose trademark is already with someone else that has to be kept in mind now after that uh, one indicates uh, the beginning as i said from which date uh, does the partnership begin and uh, then the partners partners profit and loss sharing ratio has to be indicated that uh, that so if there are two partners they may have an arrangement that wherein they will share the profits of the partnership in 50 50% or as per their mutual agreement it may be 60 40 it may be 70 30 it all depends uh, that has to be indicated very clearly that this partner will have this much profit sharing ratio this partner will have this much if there are more than two then accordingly the profit sharing ratio has to be indicated profit as well as loss then the rights and liabilities then upon entering into this partnership firm that these are the rights now partners may want to divide uh, their work uh, not every partner may be able to do everything though under the partnership act everyone is you know acts for all uh, the act of one partner becomes the act of all that is the principle of agency on which the partnership is based but for their own convenience for smooth running of the firm they may indicate in the partnership deed itself that look this partner named x may be responsible for running the bank accounts uh, you know he or she may be uh, made an authorized signatory he or she may be given power to you know uh, do all formalities which are required to open a bank account uh, do work with various authorities others may be you know assign some work which uh, may be a desk job or dealing with the vendors dealing with distributors depending on the nature of the work they may indicate in the partnership deed itself that uh, you know this is the kind of uh, work which is assigned to a particular partner uh, under this partnership deed now apart from that after indicating the you know the uh, title of the business the number of partners uh, they may indicate if the partnerships may be of two types one may be at will one may be for a specific duration now if uh, these partners want to have this partnership firm for a specific duration that has to be indicated in the partnership deed itself that this partnership will be running from commencing from the commencement deed uh, be beginning of the, the the date of the partnership deed up to if they want to put an uh, you know specific date that this partnership will terminate as a at a particular date then they may if they want it for uh, you know indefinite period then they will have to indicate no termination date it, 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 you don't need to include if a partnership that deed doesn't show the termination date of partnership the end date of partnership then its partnership at will it will go on in per perpetuity though there is a dissolution clause as well we have to deal with the dissolution deed of partnership as well that has to be there but then they don't they don't need to specify a particular date on which that partnership will end now after these clauses then one may have a clause pertaining to the uh dissolution itself so the topic is uh, you know there, there is a uh, dissolution deed indicated in the module as well but the terms of dissolution are uh, you know kept usually in the partnership deed itself now one of the terms you know by which uh, one of the reasons uh, by which a partnership may terminate uh, there are various factors which are included uh, in the uh, indian partnership act itself 
but there are certain other factors which one may include in the partnership that this may terminate on happening of this event this partnership can terminate uh, you know by if a partner wants to voluntarily retire from the firm this all has to be indicated now the the dissolution may have various modes as i was telling you one is as per the partnership act which uh, shows uh, which one of the sections provides that uh, uh, the firm may compulsorily be dissolved on happening of if all partners except one are declared insolvent by a court or if the firm is declared that they are involved in some illegal activities then that's called as compulsory dissolution under the uh, depending uh, under the law apart from that there can be dissolution on the happening of certain contingent events like if the partnership is for a particular fixed term then it may end if the partnership deed shows that this partnership will continue only upon for uh, this much time one year five years 10 years it may end or if it is indicated that on completion of a particular task you know sometimes you know what they call joint ventures or such uh, you know uh, uh, entities are created for a particular task so if i enter into a partnership with a person to complete a particular task to complete a particular project then the partnership deed should indicate once this project is over this partnership is only for this particular project once that project that task is completed partnership will automatically get dissolved now apart from that death of a partner may also result in uh, you know uh, the dissolution of the firm if there are all especially when there are only two partners in a firm and one of them dies then the partnership will dissolve or if there are more than uh, you know uh, two partners and one of them dies then again the partnership firm will be dissolved then those two remaining partners if they wish to continue the business they will have to uh, enter into a, a new partnership deed apart from that this uh, partnership firm may be dissolved by notice as well that is also to be provided in the partnership deed itself that uh, if a partner wants to you know at will uh, if a partner wants to exit from the firm then usually there is a clause that dissolution can be provided by any of the you know the dissolution notice may be given at will by any of the partner to other partners you know usually we indicate the period this notice should be given in advance by one month six months three months uh, that's all up to the parties how they want to go about it that whosoever wants to you know take exit from the firm or wants the firm to get dissolved especially when there are only two partners the partnership deed should indicate that dissolution can be provided by notice as well and as i was telling you there may be dissolution by court in those situations where partners may be declared as insolvent or part one of the partner or partners become mentally unstable or the partners don't abide by the terms of the you know they violate the terms of the partnership deed or a partner is acting in detriment this all has to be provided in a partnership deed and if you typically see uh, the format as i was telling you of a partnership deed they may indicate these boilerplate clauses that upon happening if a partner is acting to the detriment of the firm or is misusing the name of the firm or is illegally transferring the interest or equity of the firm to a third party then that may be breach of this partnership deed and upon that happening the partner may be you know uh, Uh, uh you know uh, taken out from the firm and uh, apart from that uh, you know the profit sharing ratio how uh, the partnership is to be uh, the, the business of partnership is to be carried out the liabilities of the partnership have to be indicated as well as we know as per law uh, in a typical uh, partnership firm under the indian partnership act partners have unlimited liability that's why the company form is little different and the limited liability partnership a uh, form was also introduced for this purpose uh, only in uh, the, the partnerships under the indian partnership act the partners have unlimited liability towards the third parties so if the partners have taken the loan in the name of the firm and they are declared insolvent or the firm goes in bankruptcy goes in losses so their personal uh, properties also liable to be attached is liable to be liquidated uh, to repay the creditors so that is one of the features or one may term it as a disadvantage of having business in the form of a partnership nonetheless it is provided there so that has to be provided in the partnership deed itself if some partners liability is limited in case of losses 
or if it has to be shared equally, that all has to be put in the partnership deed. Apart from that, you know, the accounts of the firm are to be maintained. Now, how those accounts are to be maintained, that is also to be indicated. Uh, and uh, the capital which is brought in at the time of beginning or if a partner comes, is inducted in the firm later on, that has to be indicated that this partner has contributed this much capital. This partner has usually the profit sharing ratio is in the, uh, you know, uh, uh, is in the uh, ratio of uh, the contribution depends on how, which partner if partners have con contributed equally at the time of beginning of the partnership firm. Usually the profit sharing ratio will, will be uh, equal unless indicated otherwise uh, by the parties. But if some partner has not contributed capital or has contributed lesser capital compared to the other partner, then their profit sharing, uh, profit and loss sharing ratio may vary. So these all things will have to be asked as students of law if, or as lawyers, if someone approaches us to draft a partnership deed for them, we'll ask them these questions that what is, you know, how you have to, uh, how do you want to go about sharing of profits and sharing of losses? And what is the nature of the firm and how assets are to be maintained and who are the partners who are contributing to the assets of the firm. This all has to be put in the partnership. The idea being uh, people who come together as partners, they should have absolute clarity uh, that what are the terms uh, by which we are engaged with each other, what are our duties uh, for the same, what are our liabilities, what are our rights. And it's not just between the partners. Usually there's a clause that this deed is for the you know benefit uh, of the successors, legal heirs, or any agents of the parties as well, especially in case of death, or a partner who turns you know mentally unstable or uh, you know uh, undergoes some disorder of such a nature where he or she is unable to perform his or her duties under the partnership deed, then the legal heirs step in. So they should also have clarity when that partnership deed, that document is looked into, that these are the rights and liabilities. This is what I, as a legal heir of ex-partner, am entitled to, and these are my liabilities as well. So these all things have to be indicated in the partnership deed itself. Now, apart from that, one more impo important aspect is, uh, as I said in the beginning as well, it's not compulsory to have partnership in the first place in writing. It can be oral as well. But as I was telling you, there are many disadvantages if it's oral. Then when the partnership is in writing by way of a partnership deed, is it compulsory to be registered? Now, it is not compulsory to be registered under the Registration Act. So when we deal with all these instruments, which we are going to discuss in today's you know, discussion, uh, the Registration Act of 1908 comes into play. And Registration Act under Section 17, provides uh, for documents which are compulsorily to be registered. And there are documents which uh, for which uh, registration is optional. But when it comes to a partnership deed, it is not a compulsorily registered, uh, re registrable document. But for the benefit of parties, for the benefit of partners itself, it is always advised that such a document, such a deed, after it is drafted and finalized and signed, it should be registered before the sub-registrar so that tomorrow, in case there is any dispute, no partner, no party can turn around and say, look, this is a forged document. These, this is one of the key benefits once we register, get a document registered. Same goes for the wills, though wills are not uh, the uh, topic for today. But will can also be oral, will maybe in writing, uh, but it's not necessary to uh, uh, get a will registered. But there are always benefits if it is registered it carries more weight, it is more authentic, can be relied upon in the courts of law as well. Though even if it's unregistered, it may be relied upon, but the standard of proof uh, is little uh, difficult in those documents which are not registered. So it's always advised, even though the law does not make it necessary that a partnership deed should be registered mandatorily, but it's always advised that parties, once they execute it, they should uh, you know, uh, get it registered before the sub-registrar, and the pro process is not much difficult, especially in metropolitan cities uh, like Delhi. Uh, the, now things are, most of these, uh, uh, the document registration is undertaken online. It's not a difficult process. Parties just need to present themselves once and all the appointment, all the payments, stamp duty and uh, registration charges are paid online. So it's not much difficult task. And now if partners want to indicate in the partnership firm, 
that uh, you know uh, uh, a certain premium may be paid so say for example somebody is an expert in some kind of business and that person is offered to enter into a partnership with a person who is not expert now that person may indicate that since i am an expert i am entitled to a premium for, for entering into partnership with you that also has to be indicated in the partnership uh, you know itself whether this premium is recurring or this premium paid to a particular partner usually for his or her expertise or contribution in the firm is for a particular fixed term or is uh, you know uh, recurring uh, at certain intervals now these are certain key things which one may keep in mind uh, when uh, you know uh, uh, drafting a partnership deed now apart from that is another topic another instrument which we need to talk about is a uh, dissolution of partnership deed now as i told you dissolution may be automatic on happening of uh, you know certain events or dissolution may be compulsory as is provided under the act itself partnership act itself but sometimes this dissolution can be by way of a document itself so that there is clarity again uh, we start our business we want to enter a partnership by way of a partnership deed sometimes partners want to end the business by way of a deed of dissolution of partnership as well though again not necessary but to have clarity so that there are no claims later on uh, against each other uh, you know the partners filing uh, suits or claims against each other uh, on the basis uh, of being partners earlier uh, to have clarity on that one may enter one may execute a document what we call as dissolution deed now uh for that we need to understand what is dissolving a partnership this is again provided under the act itself uh, that when a partnership firm comes to an end due to happening of various events that is called as dissolution of partnership firm discontinuing of business uh, you know under the name of that particular firm is called the dissolution of partnership now when dissolution has to take place now all the rights and liabilities assets and liabilities have to be settled either by you know now how do we settle the, the the firm has its own accounts firm has its own goodwill firm may for a period of time acquire some assets firm has capital partners have capital and uh, we all know that firm is different from the uh, you know the partners itself so in case of dissolution first of all uh, you know we usually contact some chartered accountant some ca with the accounts that uh, let's see what are our Uh, you know assets and liabilities now how do we go about distributing these assets or liabilities since we intend no longer to continue the business or a certain event has happened which has led to the dissolution of the firm now we'll have to either sell off those assets and distribute the proceeds of uh, you know those assets which come by way of sale or those assets may be transferred depending on the profit and loss sharing ratio or contributions or depending on the capital of each partner they may be Uh, you know transferred to partners uh, and thus the accounts which have existed with the firm may be settled as it is as i was telling you any profit or loss upon dissolution will be transferred as per their profit sharing ratio which has been agreed in the partnership deed so whenever a firm has to undergo dissolution as i told you uh, partnership deed will also have a dissolution clause that uh, you know these are the ways by which the partnership will get dissolved and as i was telling you many of those reasons are indicated in the act itself where a partnership firm may be compulsorily dissolved where it's optional or where due to happening of a certain contingent event the partnership may come to an end or if it's a partnership at will partner may give notice if it's provided under the partnership deed that he wants to take he or she wants to take an exit from the firm uh, and the firm may be dissolved so uh, this all will be uh, you know uh, taken care of in the partnership deed in the first place so when the parties intend to if the parties mutually intend to uh, dissolve uh, the partnership firm again the partnership deed should be looked into in the first place and then if one is asked to draft a deed of dissolution so first we go to the partnership deed itself what are the terms when they entered into that business accordingly the dissolution deed will be drafted on the basis of rights and liabilities indicated in the partnership deed itself now the easiest way as i was saying when the partners mutually decide you know partner there are two or more than two partners they all have mutually decided that we want to close this firm 
for whatever reasons. With the mutual consent, they may enter into an agreement. That's where this dissolution of partnership deed comes into play. Usually when it's mutual. When it's not mutual or if the partner itself dies, there is no question of you know executing this document because the other person is not there. Or if it's not mutual, it is due to happening of certain uh, unfortunate events like a partner is acting in detriment uh, to the interest of the firm, partner is alienating the assets of the firm, or is declared insolvent, or is declared mentally unwell, uh, or is suffering from a disease or a disorder, then it may not be possible to get this instrument that get this deed, uh, you know, drafted and signed. But where the partners mutually agree that we want to end this partnership, then it's better uh, to have it by way of a deed of resolution of partnership, where again, all the rights and liabilities would be indicated. So that deed of resolution in the first place, apart from the date and you know the place, the standard clauses, the parties, it will give reference, first of all, to the existing partnership between the partners that whereas so and so the partners had you know entered into a partnership wide partnership day, deed dated so and so executed at so and so place for carrying on the business under the name and style of such and such firm for this purpose or providing any services now since it will say that partners have decided to mutually end the partnership so upon the terms and conditions as indicated then it will indicate the terms now in the first place it will indicate that partners have, of course, since it's a deed of dissolution, it should be clearly mentioned that this uh, deed indicates, uh, the deed conveys the intent of the parties to mutually end the partnership. Now, if it's not mutual, then as I told you, then usually it's not the case of uh, getting a deed of dissolution signed, especially in case of you know uh, uh, compulsory dissolution, like partners are declared insolvent or the firm is carrying illegal acti activities or certain events have happened, like in the partnership deed itself, there was a fixed term, and once that term has ended, partnership deed has a uh, partnership has automatically uh, uh, dissolved, and the partnership is automatically over. So in those cases, one may not need to draft this instrument, or when the task is completed, we have, as I was telling you uh, earlier, that uh, if the partnership is for a particular object, particular task, particular project. One may indicate in the partnership deed itself upon completion of this task, this partnership will stand automatically dissolved, dissolved. And of course, if it happens due to death of a partner, especially when there are only two partners and one of them dies, so the firm will automatically dissolve. Or if there are more than one partners, more than two partners, one of the partner dies. Again, the partnership firm will automatically dissolve and the other two partners, if they want to carry on the business, they will have to settle the accounts with that, uh, you know, the partner who has died. They will have to settle the accounts with the legal here of that partner. And if they wish to continue the partnership, they will have to, uh, you know, execute a fresh partnership deed. And there may be dissolution by notice, as I was telling you. Now, all these things will have to be indicated in the dissolution deed itself that this is how the dissolution has taken place. And now this is how we want to settle the accounts. Now, this is the capital as on, you know, whichever date one is to execute this instrument, this instrument is being drawn. They will indicate, you know, if the firm is running in losses, sometimes dissolution takes place due to that reason as well, the firm is no longer profitable. So they will indicate what are the losses and how they are to be paid, whether they are to be paid by the own assets of the partners or they are to be paid from the balance, if any left with the firm from that and in what ratio. And after what is left, how it is to be divided, you know, X partners capital was this much and now he's being paid this much. We have a fixed account or a current account, whatever accounts are there and the partnership has this much capital over the years. This is, this is how it will be divided. Third party debts, of course, they have to be paid first. Loan amounts, if any, which have been taken, they have to be paid out. Now, after everything is there, this all has to be indicated in the resolution deed so that tomorrow there is no as I told you uh, that in a partnership firm under the Indian Partnership Act, partners have the unlimited liability. So it shouldn't be that one partner takes an exit and uh, the other partner is left. Usually, as I told you in partnership deed itself for convenience, one may indicate that this partner will remain the authorized signatory. So it shouldn't be that partner is made to later on suffer with the authorities because he or she was the authorized signatory before various authorities. So these all things have to be indicated in the resolution deed 
how we are going to settle accounts, especially the liabilities uh, in the order of priority that, you know, the third party debts, any loan, any mortgage, which was there, that all have to be, these all things will have to be taken into consideration and put in writing in that deed of resolution. And then if any balance amount is left, how it is to be shared among the partners? Usually it is in the, as I was telling you repeatedly, it is in the ratio of the profit sharing ratio of the partners. Now these all things will have to be indicated in that deed of resolution of partnership. And there may be certain standard clauses that, you know, upon resolution of the firm, partners won't carry on any business, you know, with this name, or they are not responsible for the act of any one of the partners upon execution of this deed beyond it, you know, after uh, deed of resolution is executed, no partner will be liable for any of the acts of any other partner post execution. These all things, these are standard things which are indicated there in the uh, deed of resolution of partnership. So at this stage, I would like to take a pause because now I'll go to the next instrument. Now, before going to the next instrument, uh, if anyone has any question or should we take questions at the end, because there are different kinds of instruments which we are going to discuss about. Mr. Sagar Pandey has raised his hand or. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Yes. Uh, am I audible, sir? Absolutely. Sir, my doubt was that uh, this lecture is for conveyancing. Yes. Sir, uh, the procedure of hiring conveyancers are not cleared until now. Can you please explain it, sir? Procedure for hiring a conveyancer now. Conveyancer can be... You know, the, can be lawyer as well. What do you mean by hiring a conveyancer? I'm not sure. How a partnership firm can hire a conventioner or a conventioner hire hota hai na iske conveyancer hota hai, conveyancer, you know, the person who drafts these documents. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So they are usually in the, they are, they provide services like lawyers. So but there are many firms, uh, you know, who have lawyers as well, or they may not be necessarily lawyers. They may be draftsmen. So who indicate who provide these services on certain uh, you know consideration? So so part they, they can be hired from the open market. So partnership firm is ko hire karti hai sir. Koi bhi kare hire. It doesn't matter how they okay. want to proceed. That's totally their choice. So okay. uh, sometimes it happens that you have an in-house counsel. So a lot of uh, these organizations these days, even if they are uh, small organizations, they have in-house counsels. So an in-house counsel will come up with uh, you know such uh, deeds. And then they may have an external counsel or they may want a lawyer to, you know, sometimes go through it, vet it. Some As a practicing lawyer, we sometimes get documents which are already drafted. You know, the clients just send them to us and ask us, please have a look. Is it, you know, compliant with everything? And this is what we want. Are these terms okay? Are they benefit? Because the client may not understand, uh, have understanding of each and every technical aspect which is there in the deed. So they may ask a lawyer to go through it for betting purposes. Otherwise, they can hire or they may have an in-house counsel who does the job. Usually, uh, businesses have access to the lawyers and uh, such persons who uh, you know, draft such documents in the beginning as well. So today, if you want to uh, go for a partnership, so how do you go about it? You you have a person with you who wants to start a business and you have you know an agreement between yourself that this is how we want to start. This is what will be the name. So you will go to a person, maybe a lawyer or any other person who is into this uh, drafting of deeds and instruments. You may ask them, you know, we want to enter into a partnership. So uh, we need a partnership deed upon these terms. So the person will give you in the similar manner if there is dissolution. The person concerned who is into such uh, work will uh, do the job. Same goes for property conveyancing. So property conveyancing, maybe usually you will have people uh, because uh, the, uh, the, register, the Stamp Act varies from state to state. Stamp duties vary. Registration charges vary because it is the law of land is the, you know, it depends on state to state. So usually we want to hire a local person who is into all this, uh, you know, who knows what are the formalities for registration, what are the documents which are required, what is the stamp duty, what, is, what are the registration charges. So they are usually available in the market wherever you want to get this instrument executed or registered. So that's how you go about it. And there are certain dedicated firms as well who provide these services online as well. But I don't know how far I can vouch for anyone. Uh, but there are many of them these days uh, who provide these services online as well. I hope Thank, you so much. Thank you so much. Any, so much. any other question on partnership deed or resolution of partnership deed? 
I think we can proceed. But uh, so before uh, we uh, actually start drafting these two instruments, please go through the Partnership Act once so that uh, one has clarity that uh, what does Partnership Act uh, provide for? Then only we go for drafting. So there shouldn't be any clause uh, in our deed which is repugnant or in derogation of the Partnership Act itself because that will be uh, later on if there's any dispute, that clause would be void to that extent. Anyway, then uh, I'm asked to talk about a relinquishment deed and a gift deed. Now, these two deeds are covered, governed by the Transfer of Property Act. Uh, for that, again, before we embark upon drafting such deeds, one should undergo uh, you know, the basic provisions, bare provisions, though the Transfer of Property Act is technical, of course, as it should be. Uh, certain basics about it. Transfer of Property Act mostly governs the transfer of immobile property in India. It's an old act, fairly old. So uh, any uh, transfer of proper immobile property, though it covers certain kinds of uh, you know uh, mobile properties as well, but generally when it comes to transfer of immobile property, it is governed by the provisions of the Pro Transfer of Property Act of 1882. Now there have been many state amendments to certain provisions of it, but be that as it may, we are not going to discuss much about the provisions of the act. But before we start drafting a relinquishment deed or a gift deed or perhaps a sale deed, these are all modes, these are all documents by which transfer of immobile property generally takes place. We need to understand the distinctions between all these deeds in the first place. What are they? What do they intend to? Uh, and uh, what are the features, what are the characteristics, and what are the limitations of, uh, you know, usually a typically a client approaches you and uh, says that, you know, I want to transfer this property within my family, or I want to sell this property, or I want to give up my ownership of a particular property. So we need to know what are the various kinds of arrangements, what are the various kinds of uh, various types of transfers which are provided under the Transfer of Property Act. And accordingly, then we'll be able to draft an instrument uh, properly depending on the requirements of the party who approaches us or a party who you know asks us to vet a particular document many a times there are you know businesses or organizations or companies who have to undertake uh, you know uh, who have to transfer property or buy property then they may ask you as an external counsel though they have in-house counsels as well but sometimes they will ask an external counsel so please have a look because uh, many a times the, the it is not so simple at, as it is between uh, you know individuals to get property transferred. But when it comes to certain organizations and uh, you know the property involves uh, many parcels of land or any other at multiple places, one will have to undergo one will have to understand the law prevailing in those states apart from the Transfer of Property Act itself. Now, so as I was talking about relinquishment deed and gift deed now. A lot of times, many of us get confused between both. Uh, sometimes, you know, people may uh, think that both of them are uh, the same, but it's not so. And in fact, I think we had a 2020 judgment of uh, High Court of Delhi where uh, the distinction was provided. And I must tell you, courts have always, when it comes to interpreting the contracts, you know, Courts have always repeatedly said in various judgments that it is not the nomenclature of the document which decides the nature of the document. It is actually the intent, the terms which are there in the document, which decide whether a particular document is what it purports to be. Say, for example, there is lease and license. Again, there's a fine distinction between lease and license and stamp duty is different. That's why a lot of times when parties actually want to have license, they may term the instrument as lease deed, where it act, whereas when you read it fully, you will see that it's a license, it's not a lease. Or at times you will leave, the, the deed will be titled as license deed. When you read the terms, it will actually be a lease deed. So what I'm trying to say is courts have repeatedly said, just because parties term a document, apne title, that you know this is a lease deed this is the relinquishment deed that is not the end of it 
because especially when it comes to uh, it's very important to understand these things when it comes to stamp duties because stamp duties are different when it comes to a relinquishment deed stamp duty is different when it comes to a gift deed and tax liabilities are also different so court has said in that 2020 judgment uh, of Delhi High Court, uh, uh, this was, I believe, yes, it was 2020. You may note down the title. It was Tripta Kaushik versus Sub Registrar 6 Delhi. So uh, this is a recent May 2020 judgment by a single bench of Delhi High Court. It has taken into account various earlier judgments on the subject as to what is the distinction between the, how do we decide whether a particular instrument is a, relinquishment deed or how do we decide whether a particular instrument is a gift deed often these two are confused both are you know used to transfer immobile property both are to be compulsorily registered because 17 provides as i was telling you registration act section 17 provides for the documents which are to be compulsorily registered and of course there are there is effect of non-registration as well they are not admissible in the court of law and there are other liabilities which flow from the non-registration so any document which conveys a right title or interest in any immobile property has to be compulsorily registered under the provisions of the registration act usually before the sub registrar concerned where the property is situated now relinquishment deed is typically a document an instrument whereby a co-owner so there is a property it has multiple owners whether ownership is claimed by way of inheritance or ownership is by way of purchase. But there are co-owners of a property. So you hold a property as a co-owner. Now you want to give up your interest in that property. But that interest can be only given up in favor of a co-owner. It cannot be in favor of a, I'm talking about the relinquishment deed. It cannot be in favor of a third party. It has to be in favor of a co-owner only, not a third party. So that is one of the basic features of a relinquishment deed you know if a person dies without leaving a will dies into state now his property is or her property usually devolves upon the legal heirs as per succession act so i don't want to go much into the law but since we are talking about a very technical instrument i will have to touch the basics so it's very important when it comes to property conveyancing we understand we should have a clear understanding of the transfer of property act we should have uh, with that clear understanding of the uh, Registration Act and, uh, of course, Indian Succession Act, these all, uh, you know, uh, supplement each other and uh, uh, one will have to read them conjointly. Then we'll be able to come up with a document which is legally perfect. And what does this relinquishment deed do? Then I'll come to the gift, gift deed and then the distinction, then the clauses which should be there. Now, as I was telling you, when one is a co-owner of a property and one wishes to give up, relinquish the share, the ownership, the rights in that particular property to other co-owners. So there are three co-owners of a property. One of them wants to give up the interest. That relinquishment may be with consideration or maybe without consideration which is not the case in case of gift. Gift is always without consideration. That's why it's called gift. But relinquishment may be with consideration or maybe without consideration. The party gives up, gives up the interest. But that giving up of interest in that property will always be in favor of a co-owner. I cannot give up as a co-owner of a property my interest in that property to a third party by way of a relinquishment deed. I may sell it. I may gift it to a third party. But a relinquishment can be only in favor of a co-owner. So please remember it. Now, it may have an element of consideration or it may be without consideration. That is there. And of course, one should remember that it is irrevocable. So is a gift deed. This can't be revoked. These are irrevocable documents once they are properly executed as per law. Unless, of course, one wants to challenge that, uh, you know, they were executed on the basis of fraud or coercion. These are only limited grounds. One may... Uh, challenge them in the court of law after they are executed properly. Otherwise, they can't be revoked. So, there's a fine distinction, as I was telling you, provided by the Honorable High Court of Delhi in Tripta Koshik versus Sub Registrar. In that case, as well, there were basically two writ petitions where the question was the same whether a particular deed which was before the court is a relinquishment deed or it's a gift deed. So, in one of the writ petitions in the same case, 
in which a co-owner by way of a relinqu by way of a document which they termed as a relinquishment deed had given up his share to one of the co-owners. So there were multiple co-owners of a property. One co-owner executed a relinquishment deed. A document what that person termed as a relinquishment deed, but in favor of only one co-owner, not all co-owners. So ultimately, when the matter came up before the Delhi High Court, Delhi High Court said, no, it's not a relinquishment deed. It is a gift deed. Because it conveys the interest of that person only to one co-owner. It doesn't convey the interest to all co-owners. So relinquishment cannot be in favor of only one co-owner. It has to be in favor of if there are multiple, of course, co-owners have to be either two or more than two. So when there are more than two co-owners and one of them wants to give up, relinquish his or her share in that property, it cannot be only in favor of I'm executing a relinquishment deed in favor of one co-owner, even though there are two remaining co-owners apart from me. So if I want to relinquish and I have to actually execute a deed of relinquishment, that relinquishment has, has to be in favor of all co-owners. Cannot be qualified only in, I am giving up my share only in favor of one co-owner. So court says, no, that's a gift deed. Actually, that is not relinquishment deed. So one need, one, we need to remember uh, when we draft any document, ultimately, if it lands up in the court, any dispute arising from such instrument, so court won't go by what is the nomenclature of that document. I am terming that document as a relinquishment deed. Somebody is terming another document as a gift deed. Court will see what is the nature of transaction. What do the parties intend by way of that document? So even if that document was termed as a relinquishment deed, Delhi High Court said no. It is not a relinquishment deed. It's a gift deed. So we need to keep those things in mind. Now that brings me to the gift. Then I was I will actually come to the, what are the certain key clauses which should be there in uh, both the deeds. Now a gift is again it's defined in the TPA itself. One may refer to section one twenty two. Defines it. Uh, what is a gift? And what are the requirements? Gift is basically, you know, there's a donor, there's a donee typically where a person by way of an instrument, what is termed as, uh, you know, a gift deed conveys immovable property or movable property. It can be for both. But the key being it, is, it should be voluntary and it is without consideration. There can't be consideration in a gift deed, unlike a sale deed. Or a relinquishment deed. Sale deed has to be on the basis of concentration. It can't be without concentration. If a sale deed is without concentration, it's void. A relinquishment deed, it's optional. Relinquishment may be on the basis of some concentration or without concentration. But gift mandatorily has to be without concentration. By one person, what law terms as whom law terms as a donor, and it's given in favor of another person who's termed in law as a donee. And the acceptance has to be made during the lifetime of the donor by the donor when the person is capable of being. So acceptance is also very important. It is not just that I make execute a gift deed without the other person to whom in whose favor I am making it, the donor. He or she has to accept it as well during my lifetime. Only then the gift is proper. Otherwise it may be void or it may be infructuous uh, if the donor doesn't accept it. So 122 of TPA may be referred. Now 122 says by way of a gift, both kinds of properties may be transferred, immovable or movable. When it's immovable, as I said, Registration Act comes into play. Registration Act makes Section 17, makes it compulsory whenever any right title or interest is transferred in an immovable property by a person to another person. It has to be by way of a registered document. So a gift deed or a relinquishment deed have to be compulsorily registered. If they are not registered, they carry their void. They carry no weight. Um, though there are later judgments uh, which we have now, they say that they may have some corroborative value if there is a dispute in the court. Otherwise, they are not admissible in law. They are not registered and they won't convey the title. So in a gift deed, it can be executed in favor of any party. Unlike a relinquishment deed, as I was telling you, relinquishment deed can be only in favor of a co-owner. Now, gift, it can be made by a donor to a donee and donee should accept it. Again, it should be mandatorily registered and it has to be voluntary and without any consideration. So in a lot of states in our country, in gifts, uh, you know, the transfer of property by way of gift deed uh, provides certain uh, benefits in terms of tax liabilities or uh, stamp duty. Usually if the gift is between the blood relatives, um, uh, blood relations, so it attracts lesser stamp duty and it may attract lesser tax liability. 
and again as i was telling you in case of relinquishment deed as well a gift can also not be revoked once the deed is executed as per law unless of course one challenges it on the basis of fraud or coercion now let's come to certain clauses which should be there in a relinquishment deed i hope we have understood by now what is the purpose of a relinquishment deed and what is the purpose of a gift deed so gift can be made to any you know third party i want to gift my property which may be movable or immovable if it's immovable it has to be registered i want to gift it to any party it may be between my blood relatives legal heirs or any third party but when it comes to relinquishment deed it can only be in favor of co-owners of a property so i can't relinquish my share in a property in favor of a third party who is not a co-owner and that relinquishment has to be if there are multiple co-owners apart from the person who's executing the relinquishment deed it has to be in favor of all if i'm only relinquishing in favor of one person then as per tritta koshik judgment of delhi high court it says it's not relinquishment it's a gift anyway so to begin with the relinquishment deed has to indicate the of course the date which is standard in any uh, you know instrument uh, the place where it is executed the parties who is the person who is relinquishing and in whose favor the person is relinquishing so it will begin with typically uh, the clause the recitals what may indicate that whereas so and so person is a joint owner or is an owner of a property which is located and the description of the property usually when we give description of the property we say uh, you know comprising of if it's a uh, you know apartment or if it's a house comprising so and so you know rooms um, uh, comprising this much area located at so and so place and we usually give it by way of a schedule we attach the you know the drawing uh, of the uh, property concerned we say that as per the uh, description given in schedule a uh, or schedule 1 or annex one uh, with this deed so that for the purposes of clarity we know what is being uh, relinquished by way of this relinquishment deed then it should indicate the person concerned who is executing the relinquishment deed the person wants to relinquish is the co-owner of this property of this much share and, and that should also be indicated that uh, this is the share of that person and this is what he wants to give up by way of present deed in favor of these persons who are the co-owners now if it is on the basis of consideration that person who is relinquishing his share in the property if that person has received consideration for relinquishment then that should indi be indicated in the relinquishment deed that this relinquishment is upon consideration which has been received or which will be given to that person uh, on those terms i mean that if it's to be given in cash or if it is to be given as uh, you know any exchange of property at some different place that has to be indicated in the relinquishment deed or if it's without really uh, without consideration that also has to be mentioned in the relinquishment deed that it is being executed without i'm giving up the person concerned is giving up his interest his ownership in the property his uh, right title and interest in the property without any consideration depending on what are the terms then apart from that it should indicate that uh, you know now onwards upon execution of this document upon execution of this relinquishment deed the person concerned who is relinquishing his or her share will have no right title or interest in the property and these persons in whose favor the relinquishment is executed will have uh, you know uh, the all but the rights that they have taale ko nikal kar split Sorry, sorry, is, uh, yes so that uh, relinquishment deed should indicate that now onwards anything concerning that share will be taken care of by the persons in whose favor relinquishment is executed you know some clauses may be similar to a sale deed you know now onwards i won't have any right title or interest or the persons in whose favor this relinquishment is given they will have all the rights over that property uh, you know to deal with that property in the manner uh you know uh, they will uh, be dealing it is solely their choice they may be selling it further or doing whatever they may mortgage it they may do whatever they have to do and this person has no right title or interest if the person is in possession of that uh, share the uh, possession status should also be indicated that you know upon execution of this relinquishment deed the person who is relinquishing his or her share is giving up possession or has handed over the possession of that 
portion, especially when it is immobile property. In mobile properties, it's conveyed by way of delivery of property. It's much easier when it comes to gifting immobile uh, mobile property. One may you know deliver the property and the gift may be complete. But when it comes to immobile property, the important element is of possession. So if I'm executing a relinquishment deed in co-owners of a property, which I'm also possessing, I'm also having possession of. So relinquishment deed should indicate that the person will give up possession on a particular date or has already handed over the peaceful possession. So that all has to be indicated. And if there was any liability to that property and uh, you know anything uh, on part of the person who's relinquishing the share, that also has to be indicated. You know, the, these are the broad terms. But the idea being, one should be able to understand what is the purpose of it. Why the relinquishment deed? So a relinquishment deed is usually uh, instead of, you know, uh, uh, people who uh, uh, die without leaving a will, dying into state, usually the property dwells upon the legal heirs as per the Indian Succession Act. If a person has, you know, uh, uh, before death has uh, executed a will, then they will go for the probate and letters at administration and that's how it will be. Now, if one of the persons who is to inherit that property doesn't want to inherit it, now for the purpose of registration, the person has to be there. So the person executes a relinquishment deed, gives up his or her share upon consideration or without consideration, depending on what are the terms. But as I was telling you, one need not to confuse it with a gift deed. Gift is for a particular, you know, a different purpose. Relinquishment is for a different purpose, though they may overlap in certain characteristics, but the purposes are different. So one of the key being, as I have been repeatedly telling you, gift can be in favor of any third party. But this relinquishment cannot be in favor of a third party. So if I have a share in a co-owned property at a particular place, I cannot say I'm giving up my share in favor of a third party who's not a co-owner. That deed would be void. And if I've executed such a deed and dispute arises, court may term it as per the Tripta Koshik's judgment, which I've cited. It is actually a gift deed, not a relinquishment deed. So it doesn't matter what is the nomenclature, though the nomenclature should be correct uh, before we embark upon such a journey. Otherwise, court has to go through all the clauses and then come to return a finding that, look, this document terms itself as a relinquishment deed, but actually we see it is a gift deed. So that should not be the case, but just for the sake of clarity. Now, this was something about the relinquishment deed. Now, when it comes to gift deed, similar clauses in the beginning, the person is the owner of such and such property, uh, maybe movable or immovable, and... Uh, the person is called donor as per law, as per 122 of the TPA. Then it will indicate what is the property one wants to give. Now, I may have uh, multiple properties and I want to give particular one. Yes, or I want to give a portion of that particular property. I may have a parcel of land somewhere. Now, if I want to give a part of it, not in uh, total. So I have to indicate the schedule of property should be attached. Uh, or the description should be given clearly as I was telling you in the relinquishment deed as well. It should be given in the beginning that this is the property we are talking about. The clear address, the Khasra number usually if it's immobile property, it has to be indicated. And how the person is the owner, that also has to be indicated. It can't be that I make a gift deed or a relinquishment deed for a property in which I have no right title or interest. I have to uh, talk about that how I am the either the absolute owner by way of inheritance or I had purchased it by so-and-so person, which was by way of a registered sale deed, number so-and-so. All these things have to be indicated in the document itself. Then I will have to name the person to whom I want to gift it. And of course, as I said, since it's a gift deed, it has to be without consideration. So it has to be clearly mentioned that, of course, since it's a gift deed, it is without consideration. There is no consideration. Now, if it is between blood relatives, if it's between, uh, you know, relations, that also has to be indicated that you're gifting it to so-and-so person who is related to you, uh, you know, who's related to you by way of this relation, that also has to be indicated. Then, uh, of course, those standard clauses will come in every instrument like this is executed in the full capacity, full mental faculties without any coercion, undue influence, fraud, they all stand, these all standard clauses have to be mentioned um, in the deed itself. Apart from that, the description as I was emphasizing on in relinquishment deed as well as the gift deed, it has to be, it should be clearly mentioned that this is the description because often we may be giving up a portion of it. We may not be giving up fully 
we may be gifting a portion of property now it shouldn't be used as a tool to harass me later on i am gifting somebody in good faith um, being uh, you know gracious to gift some portion of my property to a particular person now that person shouldn't later on turn around and say that you know look this is what was intended or this whole was intended to be um, given up as gift so what is important is the description the schedule the property has to be identified especially when it's immobile property that has to be clearly identified so if there's a schedule of property which is being attached to the deed uh, itself so that schedule should indicate if it's not this i gave you example of a parcel of land uh, and you are gifting a portion of it now that portion will have to be indicated that this is the portion you are gifting you are you're intending to gift and th these are the terms on which it will be so one important you know the requirement of a gift is as per 122 itself it has to be accepted by the donee during the lifetime of the donor it can't be that i have executed a gift deed in favor of a donee and the donee didn't accept it during my lifetime and i pass away the person cannot later on come with that deed and say that look i am the uh, you know uh, person to whom it was gifted the acceptance is very much important in uh, uh, a gift deed unlike in other deeds uh, in gift deed acceptance is very much a requirement of law so the moment somebody intends to gift uh, as a donor to a donee some property mobile or immobile the donee should be accepting the same and the acceptance means in law rights and liabilities so if i accept a particular property as a gift i step in the shoes i can you know get it mutated by way of that gift deed and if there are any liabilities if there are any encumbrances on that property that also come to me say for example somebody gifts me a mortgage property though it can't be done legally it is uh, tricky because the papers are usually once some property is mortgaged the papers lie with the financial institution concerned but uh, having said that if i execute a gift deed of my property which is mortgaged or which has some income runs which has some liability or it's not mortgaged you know it has some property tax over it which is pending since many years then the person who is the donee who receives it who accepts it steps in my shoes and he or she will have to later on pay it so this all has to be indicated in the gift so gift deed will indicate the description of the property very clearly it will indicate the relationship between the parties the donor and donee it may indicate any other terms they may have uh, but it should indicate clearly that now onwards any liabilities you know it you may have it in this fashion that i have paid all there is no encumbrance on the property usually in sale deeds we uh, have a specific clause since we are not going to discuss sale deed today but in sale deeds we have a particular clause which specifically says that there is no encumbrance there is no mortgage on this property which is being sold by the seller uh, but upon transfer of this property by way of this instrument any such future encumbrance any such future liability by way of property tax any other uh, you know dues to the authorities will be the job of the buyer not the seller till that time any uh, you know encumbrance on the property uh, and the in fact the seller has to indicate that the property is free from encumbrances and even in future we put it in the sale deed any uh, claim is brought to the uh, prospective buyer Uh, which was antedated which was you know um, which had uh, arisen at the time when the property was within the control of the seller that will be paid by the seller we put it in the sale deed but when it comes to a gift deed it is different usually they will indicate the donor will indicate that property is free from any encumbrance or the donor may put it this way that any liabilities which are attached to the prop you know the property which is sought to be conveyed by way of this gift deed will be the liability of the donor will be the liability of the person to whom it is transferred by of the gift so these all terms should be compulsorily put there then this deed carries no weight as i told you earlier as well if it is not registered under section 17 because section 17 of registration act makes any instrument which is which conveys any right title or interest in an immovable property compulsorily registrable both relinquishment deed as well as a gift deed have to be registered compulsorily upon prevailing stamp duties in that state usually it's in persons or some states have an upper cap most states uh, uh, you know uh, have the stamp duty as per the value of the property 
for females it's lesser by a percent or so for males it's more uh, you know compared to females so it all depends on that uh, but when it comes to give deed between blood relatives certain states uh, make it absolutely uh, you know uh, uh, stamp duty free uh, but uh, many states have a limited stamp duty uh, on instruments like gift deed when it is between blood relatives so uh, uh, that that's how that then uh, the people that somebody asks the conveyancer how do we hire them so once we approach a conveyancer now a layman may not know all these technical technicalities that how can i transfer a particular property and if a person approaches you that this is what i want to do i want to you know transfer my property in favor of my son or some blood relative you may indicate if it's without consideration then you may give an option that you can do it by way of a gift deed you may do it by though we are not discussing bills today you may do it by way of a bill but the uh, will has a particular feature that it can be only executed after the death of the testator during the lifetime of the testator it can be revoked it can be changed and it cannot be executed during the lifetime of testator it is only uh, you know executed once the testator dies but if you want instant transfer it may be by way of a gift deed it may be by way of a relinquishment deed but purposes are different for both the instruments if anyone has any question at this stage you may ask otherwise then i'll come to the notice under 106 of transfer of property act anyone has any question regarding relinquishment deed or gift deed now please uh -huh. go to that judgment which i had mentioned tripta koshik versus sub registrar 6 delhi yes somebody is saying something Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I have a doubt regarding the relinquishment deed, sir. Yes, uh, sir. If I want to waive off my father, my property rights from the father's property, would I have to make a relinquishment deed? Ah, uh, yes. Property. I mean, I mean, uh, you mean uh, the property has not been yet transferred, but you will inherit it in future. That's what you are saying. Yes, sir. The ancestral property is the right. Our property rights. Property rights. उसको मैं waive off करना चाहता हूँ. तो उसके लिए मुझे रेलिंक्वेस्टमेंट डीड बनानी पड़ेगी इफ यू वांट टू गिव अप यस ओके सर व्हाट वुड बी द कंटेंट्स इन दैट दैट यू आर यू विल हैव टू फर्स्ट इंडिकेट हाउ यू हैव यू नो हाउ यू विल बी द यू विल हैव राइट्स इन दैट प्रॉपर्टी इन द फर्स्ट प्लेस सी इन एंसेस्ट्रल प्रॉपर्टी यू हैव राइट्स द मोमेंट अ चाइल्ड इज कंसीव्ड एंसेस्ट्रल प्रॉपर्टी नोबडी कैन यू नो आउस्ट यू Uh, in the ancestral property but when it comes to personal property especially under the hindu laws then the father the person who has the personal property uh, has acquired it personally uh, has the right uh, to decide that who will uh, you know how that will be divided but when it comes to ancestral property of course the moment a child is conceived uh, in the womb itself the child has rights and if you want to give up then you may indicate that in whose favor you want to give it up thank you sir yes i hope that answers your question but when it comes to the, the such properties you will have to first indicate that how that property flows to you you know you are the son of so and so who is the owner or this is what is your ancestral property then you will have to indicate uh, all that in your relinquishment deed and in whose favor you are relinquishing so of course as i told you it can be only in favor of co owners so then you will have to indicate that you are relinquishing it on the basis of concentration as i was saying or without concentration it can be either ways uh, th that's how you can do it thank you thank you so much sir welcome yes can anyone has any questions yes any other question anyway that makes me that takes me to the notice under 106 of transfer of property act again we go to it's a particular section which is used for termination of lease so the section is termed as you know uh, it's about the duration of leases when it comes to uh, the, 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 when there is no written contract now a lease may be oral lease may be uh, you know uh, in writing uh, and uh, we all uh, would know i assume uh, most leases which we uh, execute are only for 11 months and why is it so can anyone answer why is typically a lease deed those of you who live on rent uh, mostly would have a lease only for 11 months if if lease is more than 12 months it may be charged as a stamp duty uh 
you are partially right, not just stamp duty, it is compulsorily registrable under the Registration Act itself, as well as 107 of the TPA. If we see, though the notice is under 106, but if we go to 107, so it says any other lease of immobile property uh, has to be, you know, uh, compulsory by way of a registered document. So if it is up to one year, as per the Registration Act and as well as TPA, it is not compulsorily registered to be registrable. It can be, you know, by way of a notarized document on a stamp paper, depending on stamp duty kitni hai aapke state mein. Delhi may usually we put it on, uh, you know, a stamp duty of 100 rupees stamp paper, but then we get it notarized. Notary is just that the person certifies that this person has, uh, I have checked the documents and he's the person who has signed it before me. Otherwise not compulsorily registrable if it is for up to one year. The moment a lease is for more than a year, then it is compulsorily to be registered under the provisions of the Registration Act. And the stamp duty would be as per the, uh, you know, the value of the lease and uh, the time it is for. Accordingly, the um, stamp duty will be calculated. Now, when it comes to 106, in case <clears throat> a person, the lessee, so there are two parties in a lease, lesser is the landlord who leases out the property and the person to whom the property is leased out is called a lessee in law. So, uh, I hope we understand what is a lease. What is a lease? Lease mein hota kya hai? Though we, the topic is not lease and license, they are fine topics, but broadly we'll understand what is the, uh, what is a lease typically. So a lease typically is to put it simply where the owner of a property transfers the property to another person, not the title, the usage to a person for a particular purpose. Of course, lease will indicate what is the purpose for maybe commercial, it may be residential, it may be agricultural, depending on what is the property. But uh, the lessee to whom the property is transferred, of course, on consideration, lease has to be on consideration has all the rights, enjoys all the rights over the property in terms of usage, but of course, without title and has certain limitations when it comes to altering the property or carrying out modifications. Those, those all things are there. You will typically pick up what is termed as a rent agreement. A rent agreement is a lease agreement only. Uh, you will find out all these terms that you, know, you are leasing out uh, this property uh, for this much period, starting from this uh, date, and uh, the rent payable would be this much on monthly basis by 7th, by 5th of every month you will transfer. And if you don't transfer, you will vacate upon you know termination of the lease. Uh, you will hand over peaceful uh, possession. Astha has raised her hand. Yes, Astha. Hello, hi, sir. Is then we term as a possession also? The lease then? Uh... Yes, yes. Of course, lease has, has to be possession. Possession has to be delivered. Yes, yes. One has possession as a tenant, landlord, tenant, or legally we term them as lesser, lessee. Lesser is the landlord, lessee. lessee is the tenant. So tenant, of course, has the possession. You have all the rights to enjoy the property. You have the possession, of course, uh, but without the title. You are not the owner. Without the ownership, but the without possession the remains with the tenant. Absolutely. So that's okay, typically, thank you, sir. That's typically yes. it. And uh, there's another way properties, you know, uh, if you want to limit the rights of uh, the uh, person to whom you are letting it out, uh, you may do it by way of a by way of a license agreement. Usually government properties, uh, you know, the properties of the government when they are to be let out, they don't execute leases, they would execute license. You know, the, the shops in government owned malls or government owned uh, entities will typically find they have lease uh, license agreements. The license has uh, limited, you know, some rights are limited in terms of usage. You know, you may have a particular time, the keys may be with the concerned person of that owner and so on and so forth. But we are not going into the lease and license, but we are on the section 106 uh, TPA notice. Now, when a lease has ended, if it's for 11 months or if it's for usually leases for a particular period, it can't be for it can't be in perpetuity that everything will be taken care of in the lease deed itself. Now, if a lease has ended and the tenant, the lessee, is not vacating the property which was leased out. Now, what is the remedy? 
one may file an eviction suit uh, but before that there is a notice which is typically given under 106 of the transfer of property act now you may give it yourself but usually clients give it through lawyers so there's no particular format again for this notice uh, as i said when it comes to other documents other instruments one needs to understand the law so for drafting this notice as well under 106 one has to understand the law behind it in particular 106 itself so 106 says you know uh, the duration of that lease it would be usually when there is um, you know no period indicated uh, uh, there is no contract between the parties regarding an immobile property though it terms classifies properties for agricultural purposes or manufacturing or for any other purposes it can be terminated you know the such lease can be terminated with six months notice when it comes to a property which is for agricultural or manufacturing purposes which was leased out but when it comes to any other property then it may be terminated uh, with a notice of uh, 15 days uh, otherwise uh, it is uh, as per 106 it is a notice which is has to be for uh, six months if one wants to terminate such a, a lease especially when there is no uh, time period or there is no uh, uh, contract there is no document between the parties for the lease because i told you lease can be for uh, you know it may be made orally as well but we have in the earlier part of our discussion discussed what are the benefits of having things in writing and especially uh, uh, having them registered so tomorrow there is no ambiguity and it provides much clarity uh, between the parties now this period has to be reckoned from the date of receipt of notice by the tenant or the lessee now this 106 notice, if it's the property is used for manufacturing or agricultural purposes, that notice under 106 has to be given, uh, or a six months notice has to be given. But if it's for any other uh, lease of any other immobile property, then uh, it is terminable. Um, either it, the lease can be terminated either by lesser or lessee with 15 days notice. Now, usually these clauses have to be indicated in the lease deed itself or rent agreement itself that the termination can be by either parties by way of you know if it's agriculture or uh, you know manufacturing uh, uh, purpose property by way of six month notice to the other party if it's you know a residential or any other commercial property which is doesn't fall within these two categories then it may be terminated by either of the parties by 15 days notice now you have a, uh, it depends again on if you have a lock-in period in a um, lease agreement, that lock-in period is usually in those lease agreements which are more, for more than one year. So if I want to establish my office somewhere, so if I hired a, uh, if I've taken a, a floor on rent from someone and I have, uh, you know, invested some uh, money in terms of uh, establishment, uh, in terms of, you know, furniture and other uh, furniture and fixtures. Now, I would want that place, especially when I am running my um, organization from such a place, I shouldn't be in a dilemma that uh, my lesser may be giving me a 15 days notice and asking me to vacate. It may not be possible for me. Now, in those situations, we may have a lock-in clause in uh, the lease deed itself, which says that this lease deed may be for five years or whatever time, but it will compulsorily have a lock-in period for one year or two years. So what lock-in period means during that period, neither the lesser nor the lessee can leave the property. You know, you will be liable to pay the rent. It doesn't matter. You can't terminate the lease in the lock-in period. Otherwise, if it doesn't indicate any lock-in period, then the duration, uh, you know, as per the lease deed, it may be terminated by way of 15 days notice or when it is an agricultural property or a manufacturing uh, you know, the property is used for agricultural purpose or for any manufacturing purposes, there has to be a six months notice. Now, as I said that there is no particular uh, format for this notice, but there are certain clauses which should be indicated in the notice itself. Now, in the first place, it should be delivered to the party by way of typically a registered post so that you have an acknowledgement due that it was actually delivered. So, of course, it starts with date. You indicate the person to whom you want to send it if you want to send it by a lawyer, then a lawyer will send it on your behalf. He or she will say are the instructions of so-and-so, my client, named so-and-so, son of so-and-so, daughter of so-and-so, as the case may be, 
you know, resident of so-and-so, I'm serving you this notice. Then you will indicate that you are a tenant of my, if it's on behalf of my client, then I'll say you are a tenant of my client uh, for the premises situated. Or if you are giving it in person, then you will say you are my client of my premises, which are situated at so-and-so and which was let out to you. If it's let out by way of a lease deed in writing, then you will give reference to that lease deed. It was let out to you by way of this lease deed, which was executed on uh, so-and-so date at a monthly rental of so-and-so, you will indicate it. Then you will say tenancy commences kahan se, from which period it commenced and when it is ending. Now, by way of this notice, you will clearly indicate that you intend to terminate the, uh, your tenant, the, the other party's tenancy with effect from this date. Now, it has to be 15 days. Notice has to be given from the receipt. That is what uh, the uh, 106 itself provides that this period of 15 days or six months, as the case may be, will be reckoned from the date of receipt of notice by the other side. So you will indicate that your tenancy is terminated. Usually if you're sending it today, at least leave a gap, you will you can calculate that if it is to be delivered by post, it may take typically a two or three days, or if it's within the same state or same district, it may just take one day, depending on that. So you put a reasonable date there, which is, you know, 15 days is compulsory as per the law, as per the section itself, then you may have, you know, uh, what we term as the time taken by the postal authorities, you may calculate that reasonably and put a date that uh, I want to terminate your turn. You know, this notice uh, is given to terminate your uh, tenancy from my premises with effect from so and so date. Now, this 15 days period is the minimum period. You may give more time, you may give one month notice, so it doesn't matter, but 15 days is minimum. You can't ask someone to vacate before 15 days. So uh, then you will indicate that you are directed to, you are advised or directed to hand over the peaceful possession of premises on or before the said date. And in case, of course, you fail to hand over the peaceful possession, then my client, or if you are in person, I have the you know uh, rights to initiate legal proceedings against you and uh, file an eviction proceedings against you in a court of competent jurisdiction. That's how you put it. It's a simple notice. Uh, but the description of property, monthly rental, uh, lease deed, um, I assume most of the times we uh, have written leases, uh, you know, the lease, the property is let out by way of a written instrument. So if there is a written instrument, please indicate, please refer that instrument uh, that uh, this lease deed, you were let out this property at uh, situated at so-and-so place, description of the property that these are the rooms or whatever was let out and your tenancy commences, commenced on this date by way of this lease deed, which was executed on so-and-so date now and it ends on so and so date then if you want to end it you indicate you will have to indicate the date for which you are giving the notice for termination of uh, the lease that your uh, this notice is being given for termination of lease of this property with effect from this date and then of course you will hand over you are directed to hand over the peaceful possession of the property before on or before so that's how you will indicate now what it does is once if the if the your tenant fails to hand over the peaceful possession of the property, fails to uh, vacate the property within that time period. And if you want to file an eviction suit, eviction proceedings before the court of competent jurisdiction, you will show that, look, I have already given the notice under 106 of the Transfer of Property Act and the person concerned, the tenant has received it. That is also important. So it's not just dispatching the notice. You will have to get the, if it's registered post by acknowledgement due AD card, you will get the AD card back with the report, whether it was delivered to the person or not. If you are delivering it in person, then please take the signatures receiving on, because you will be keeping a photocopy. Then you will take signatures of the party concerned or the family member concerned that they have received it with the date. Or if it's being sent by a lawyer, usually sometimes lawyers also send it. So they will send it either by speed post or registered post. They will uh, check out the tracking report online if it's speed post that it was delivered. So that's very important uh, for the court to be seen, to be uh, put before the court that I had given notice under 106, which was delivered on this and this date. However, even after expiry of the period given in the notice, the person concerned has not handed over the peaceful possession, has not vacated the property. As such, we have filed the eviction proceeding. So basically, 106 notice is for termination of a lease. So please go through 106, 107 and related sections in the Transfer of Property Act. 
and after that uh, i come to section 80 of the cpc notice which is given under section 80 of the cpc again cpc is a very elaborate act in fact all these laws go hand in hand when it comes to cpc one will have to go through the sra uh, specific relief act one will have to go through the registration act and uh, one will have to go through the tpa so they are all related they supplement each other so 80 without wasting any time 80 provides for notice when it comes this is in part four you know when suits are filed against the government or public officers or suits are filed by government or by public officers so when a suit is to be filed against the government one cannot institute a civil suit in any court of law against a government state government or the central government or a public officer who is acting in you know who has acted um, uh, in the color of his or her office without giving notice under section 80 of the cpc again this notice doesn't have a particular format but it's a compulsory notice there are exceptions itself provided in section 80 when this notice may be waived in certain particular cases when the exigency is demand you may satisfy the court why you may ask the civil court before whom you have uh, preferred the suit against the government or the state or the public officer that why you couldn't give you couldn't comply with section 80 you may seek exemption and depending on the facts and circumstances of the case and the relief you are seeking court may or may not exempt you if the court doesn't exempt you then again they will return the plaint and ask you to comply with section 80 if court finds sufficient reasons which you have indicated in your exemption application uh, that uh, i may be given the plaintiff may be exempted from serving a notice under section 80 uh, then uh, they may take further steps as per the law but Section 80 makes it mandatory that when a suit is instituted against the government, I mean, if it's the central government, then you may term it as Union of India. It says in the beginning clause, uh, you know, 779 itself says that uh, if it's indicate if it's against the state, then the uh, state should be named by, you know, the uh, state government. Now, to whom this notice is to be served, Section 80 itself indicates, if you have a look at Section 80 of the CPC, though there have been certain amendments, uh, to the section itself after the JNK Reorganization Act of 2019. So you may find in the early acts they may be excluding or including the state of JNK, but they have now been amended. So this notice has to be given. The minimum period of this notice is two months. So the idea of Section 80 is what? Idea is that uh, you know the unnecessary litigation may not be. Uh, especially when it comes to civil suits, may not be filed against the state government or the central government. And they have sufficient notice before a party takes them to the court. Maybe they may remedy the problem. The problem with which the party is filing the suit against the state or central government. The central government or state government, if it is possible, they may take, uh, you know, corrective steps uh, within those, uh, within that two months time. So this notice under section 80 has to be for two months so until the expiration of two months from the date of this notice one cannot institute suit against the state government on the central government so the idea is put to put them through notice under this section indicating that i am this person and uh, this is the i want i'm i'm filing a suit i am intending to file a suit against you and i'm giving you this notice it is in fact it is titled as notice under section 80 of the cpc so you indicate usually given by a lawyer that under the instructions of so-and-so client, I am serving you this notice. I intend to file a suit against, if it's, you know, the central government, uh, then you will have to give the notice to the secretary of that particular department of central government. Now, if it is uh, against the state government, then it is the chief secretary of that state you will give that notice to. Uh, now, if it is, uh, you know, uh, the, the suit is against the state government, the secretary to that government or chief secretary, or it may be as section 80 indicates, it may be to the collector of the district as well. Or if the suit is intended to be filed against a public officer, then it may be, uh, the public officer may be named and this notice has to be given. This notice has to be delivered at the public officer's office or the concerned department, the secretary, uh, usually the secretariat concerned, you will have to get it delivered there, usually by way of a post. Uh, by way of you know speed post or the acknowledgement uh, yeah, registered AD. Now AD itself indicates if the suit is of urgent nature 
and you are seeking some urgent relief against the government, then you may seek exemption uh, and uh, say that uh, as an interim measure, I am approaching the court and I couldn't give notice. Otherwise, when you have to file a suit against a state government or central government or a public officer who has acted in the discharge of his duties, you want to file a civil suit. Notice of two months under Section 80 is compulsory before the suit may be registered and admitted. So, as I was saying, there is no particular format for this uh, notice under Section 80, uh, but it has to indicate that uh, this is the cause of action. Basically, this is what you are giving the notice for, uh, and you intend to file a suit against this particular, uh, you know, uh, state government or the central government. And uh, uh, this is you are putting them to notice. Basically, it's a it is not a very detailed notice. You don't need to. And you may sometimes, you know, sometimes lawyers may put a draft plaint uh, with the notice itself. Otherwise, it's not required. You just simply say that on under the instructions of uh, so and so client residing at so and so place. You know, he is intending, he or she is intending to bring the uh, suit against this state or central government, as the case may be, as a dependent or a public officer. And then you name the person and the office he or she is holding in a competent court of law as the cause of action is indicated here and there. Then you give the cause of action for the intended suit. You indicate what is the purpose, what gave you rise to the cause of action. Uh, so usually when we have to file a suit against the government, state or centre, we may have given them a notice before actually proceeding with notice under section 80 that look, usually we give representations or you may term them as notices. If the government is not taking, you have certain rights um, or a government department or a state is not discharging its functions or duties and your rights are affected. We give representations, we write communications to the concerned officer or department. And when they have not remedied them or they have not replied to them, then finally when you are left with no other option in case you want to file a suit seeking any relief against the government, then you will have to give this notice compulsorily for it's a two months period is there. So within those two months after the notice, during those two months, one has to wait. And in those two months, if the government remedies, you know, Jinko Apne notice dia, the one, the department, the state, or the center to whom the notice was served, if they take corrective steps or if they indicate that they want to settle the matter with you or if they are taking corrective, it's your choice. But two months period is compulsory as per 80. So you will simply indicate that on if you want to give, you, you may give it directly as well, but usually parties give it since you are, uh, you know, going to have a lawyer to file this suit as well. So if you want to make government a party, you will, your lawyer will tell you that before we actually file the suit, we'll have to give a two months notice under section 80, indicating the name of the department concerned, uh, name of the state concerned, or name of the officer concerned, depending on who you are intending to make the party in your suit, you will have to tell them this is the cause of action, kindly take notice under section 80. So when you say it's a section, section 80 notice, you indicate the cause of action. So the law is sufficiently section 80 is complied and on upon expiration of period of uh, two months then you may bring in a suit, suit before the court of competent jurisdiction saying that whatever cause of action was there with your plain with documents along with that you will have to file this section 80 notice as part of your suit in your documents indicating that i have complied with section 80 of the cpc anyone has any question at this stage otherwise i'll come to section 138 of ni act Any questions? So that brings me to the Negotiable Instruments Act. And uh, I assume that many of you, uh, since it's a compulsory paper in uh, most of the law schools, uh, must have, uh, or even if you haven't studied it, but most of us must are aware about the dishonor of checks. And 138 is the provision which talks about the penalty and, you know, what are the requirements when it comes to dishonor of check? How do we go about it? So basically, the liability under 138 of NI Act, which provides for punishment, you know, which may extend to two years or double the amount of check with the fine, the liability actually kicks in. The genesis of any complaint under NI Act starts with a notice of demand. So if there's a check which was issued by the, uh, you know, drawer 
and the law under 139 i won't dwell much into that there is a presumption in favor of the holder that you know the check which you have received of course that's a rebuttable presumption but the court will presume that this check which was issued was in discharge of a legally enforceable debt or liability so a check is issued by the drawer to draw check upon presentation is dishonored then what is the remedy so a lot of you have you know we have lakhs of cases uh, pending when it comes to cases under 138 of nir and we have dedicated courts now which deal with uh, the cases under negotiable instruments act now a check is presented for in cashment and it's returned unpaid now there may be various reasons why it is returned unpaid usually you know arrangement is not there you know there's there are insufficient funds account may be closed now we have judgments on that uh, that it is still a dishonor of check even if the account is closed or there may be stop payment instructions then 138 says it's an offense now how do we go about it the proviso itself again you will have to go through 138 not just 138 in fact the whole nia but in particular 138 now it says in proviso that the check has to be presented within the period of its validity now these days we have checks with the validity of three months of course once a check is issued you will have to present it within those three months it can't be that check had expired and it got dishonored due to expiry that it may not be an offense under 138 and then the check was returned unpaid and once it was returned unpaid the drawee the holder makes a notice of demand that is what, what is notice under section 138 one has to it's compulsory before cognizance under 142 of ni act is taken by a competent court it has to be satisfied that the notice as mandated under 138 was given to the accused to the drawer the notice of demand so that demand notice is usually sent by a lawyer now what does it indicate this demand notice of course the 138 proviso itself says it has to be given within 30 days so we have a rule of 30 15 30 what we call as so 30 days from the dishonor one has to issue this notice of demand within 15 days from the receipt the accused has to make payment accused has 15 so once the check is dishonored you have 30 days to furnish the notice of demand to serve the notice of demand upon the drawer the accused and once the drawer received your notice of demand he or she has 15 days to make the payment of that dishonored check to you now once that period of 15 days is over then you may prefer a complaint before the competent court who's in metropolitan cities we have mms mmni act negotiable instruments act special courts which deal with such complaints now these are mandatory compliances as per 138 so 138 itself provides the moment a check is dishonored you will have to if you want to take it further you will have to serve a notice of demand now if you have not served a lot of cases which come to us uh, there is defective notice or notice was never served or served on a wrong address or you know there is rarely a case when the notice was not served at all so the notice is not served is defective is uh, you know doesn't indicate uh, the correct address then the case may later on it may prove, prove fatal to the complaint case which you will actually prefer if the uh, accused uh, doesn't pay the amount so a check is presented it is dishonored 30 days as per the proviso to 138 you have to serve the notice of demand in writing to the drawer uh, or the accused making the demand for that amount now what do you indicate we are concerned with the drafting of this notice under 138 now what do we indicate in such a notice so first of all we'll indicate you know it will be usually on behalf of a lawyer uh, sending it uh, you know uh, lawyer sending it on behalf of a party the person uh, the lawyer will say uh, that you know under instructions of so and so person i am serving this notice uh, to you so uh, it will indicate the uh, first of all uh, what was the nature of relation that my client is in the if it's a you know business relation if it was in discharge of some goods which the person concerned had taken from you and he had given you a check which was dishonored so you will indicate that my client had 
you know your your client had you had taken goods from my client on credit on so and so date and on so and so date in discharge of the liability for the same for consideration amount of the same you had issued a check for an amount of rupees so and so which was presented by my client on so and so date before so and so bank however it was returned unpaid with the remarks because once a check is returned unpaid your bank will inform you and uh, there will be a return memo what we term as which again is part of the complaint then the return memo will indicate the reason uh, why a particular check was returned uh, dishonored why a particular check was returned so that reason you will indicate you know this check was returned unpaid due to insufficiency of funds or due to account instruct stock payment instructions or due to whatever the reason may be account closed so you will indicate that so then you, you finally say uh, you know uh, you are hereby given a notice of you know 15 days uh, to make the uh, payment of the amount of jubi check uh, whichever amount would be there in the check uh, so you will indicate that failing which you know uh, necessary action civil criminal may be initiated now what is important is in a notice under 138 you will have to indicate for what purpose this check was given to you so it can't be if i am giving a check as a gift to someone for example i draw up a check for 1 lakh rupees or any amount x amount in favor of my friend or any person to whom i have no liability i'm giving it as a gift and this check is returned unpaid somehow that person may not be able to file a 138 case against me because there was no legally enforceable debt though there is a presumption under 138 in favor of every holder of a check every negotiable instrument that it was issued uh, for uh, discharge of a legally enforceable debt or liability that's a presumption which is rebuttable but in the notice which is the notice of demand under 138 which you serve upon the drawer you will have to indicate that this check which this amount was issued in consideration of like i give you example of sale of goods so somebody has taken goods from you and that person gave you check somebody had taken loan from you that person is returning it by way of a check so you will have to indicate that in your notice that this was issued by you in discharge of this liability towards my client however when this check was presented for in cashment on so and so date it was returned on so and so date because dates are important because the act itself provides a timeline 30 days with after you get in communication from your bank that the check is not honored so uh, the, the dates are very important uh, in uh, this notice as well as the proceedings under the nia act because the timeline is provided by the act itself so 30 days uh, time is there to serve this notice of demand upon the drawer so you will have to indicate when the check was issued, given what was the reason that person has given you so you will indicate that it, this was in, in discharge you will highlight it it was in discharge of a liability you won't just say that you had issued a check for this amount and we presented it and we returned sometimes that is the defect in the notice the notice doesn't indicate what was the liability for which the check was indicate issue for which the check was issued so the notice of demand should clearly indicate what is the liability of the drawer what is the liability of the person to whom the notice is being sent in the notice itself then you will indicate on this date it was presented for in cashment it was returned unpaid with the return memo remarks whatever the remarks may be there in the return memo insufficient funds exceeded arrangement account closed stop payment instructions you will say now by way of this notice you are hereby called upon to Uh, pay uh, this amount uh, within 15 days to my client failing which necessary action shall be taken as per law now what is again important at this stage is now when a check is issued by an organization by an entity say a partnership firm say even a sole proprietorship firm say a company then a lot of times the defect in the notice is the notice of demand is served only in the individual capacity of a partner of the authorized sign uh, in the capacity of the person as an authorized signatory or as a director now that notice is again defective there are number of supreme court judgments and 141 itself says when you know the offenses are committed 141 of the ni act would itself say offenses by companies now when the offenses committed by under 138 by a company then the persons who are at the time responsible for you know in charge of the company will be liable but for us as lawyers or the ones who are drafting this notice under 138 it's important to 
serve this notice of demand upon the company. So say, for example, this uh, uh, XYZ is the partnership firm. XYZ is a partnership firm. XYZ. Uh, and then the partners are ABC. Now, partner A had signed a check on behalf of a partnership firm, which was returned unpaid. Now, the, when the notice of demand is served, you will have to first put serve it, name the XYZ firm, then number two is the authorized signature. It can't be just in the name of the person as an individual because the check was issued by the partnership firm, by the organization. So that is something which is to be kept in mind. And we have many such cases which result in discharge, which result in equity uh, because the notice of demand was not served on the entity, on the company, on the partnership firm. And we have many judgments. One you may note down Anita Hadda versus Gwad. Godfrey Travels Private Limited that crystallizes the situation when it comes to offenses by companies under the NIA. So when you are issuing, when you see the check, a client approaches you, you will see who had issued the check. Check was by way of a, it was issued by, you signed by a person in the capacity of a partner of a firm, as an authorized signatory of a firm, as a director of a company. Say for example, the law school you are studying in, they'll be issuing checks uh, on daily basis to various entities. Uh, but the account would be in the name of the uh, institution itself. Now that check gets dishonored and the person has to serve demand notice. Now the demand notice would be served only uh, to the authorized signatory who has signed the check. The demand notice in the first place would be served to the institution, the organization. Then because the liability flows through the organization itself, because the organization is the responsible who has, uh, you know, the, the the, the entity in whose name the account stands uh, from which the check was issued. So please remember it to make the organization a party to serve the notice of demand to both the entities or if there are more than two, to serve more than, uh, you know, if there are the joint account holder, holders, you will have to serve uh, notice to the board. You will have to name both in the notice of demand. Otherwise, even if cognizance is later on taken on your complaint, this will be held fatal because, I mean, I have myself done it in many cases when I have appeared for the accused. Uh, we have seen that checks were issued by an entity, by a partnership or by a company, but notice of demand was never served to the company. Uh, company was never named as an accused. So it is fatal to the case of the complainant later on. So this is what you will indicate in the notice under 138. Then there is one more thing which I've been asked to talk about is reply to the notice under 138 of NIA. Now, a lot of times your client may be the one who had issued the check or who has received the notice of demand under 138. Now, what do you do in that situation? Many a time, some people would prefer not to reply, but it's not a good idea. Yeah, it doesn't matter, you know, it's maybe a notice under 138 or any other legal notice which one receives. It's always a good idea to uh, reply uh, if you want to, if you, especially if you want to put across, uh, you know, uh, clearly that this is how it is or you are not liable to pay it. So you have received a notice of demand under 138 asking you that you had drawn this check for this amount for discharge of liability, but this check was returned unpaid. And now you are called upon to make good the payment within 15 days of receipt of notice, failing which there will be a case against you. There will be a complaint against you under 138 before the concerned court. Now in that situation, you will have to first see what is the liability. Was the check issued by you in the first place? Of course, mostly, I would assume since you have received the notice, you are named in the notice, then there may be some relation. You may have uh, signed it. You may be uh, the joint account holder or somehow responsible for the, if it's a company for day-to-day -day affairs, that's how the notice may have been served to you. Now, again, there is clear law on it as well. This, this reply to 138 will be subjective uh, as to how the liability has been traced to you. As I said, uh, that when you draft a notice under 138, you will have to indicate how the person is liable to whom you're serving the notice. Now, you may be a director of a company, but you may not be responsible for day-to-day -day management of the affairs, or you may not be responsible for day-to-day -day payments or the authorized signatory. Then you may indicate that in your reply that, or you may have been director of a particular company when the check was issued, or the check may have been issued after you have left the office, but the person has still served you, uh, the notice because they thought you were still in the company. So if those are the situations, you may indicate without prejudice to your rights that, you know, this check has been issued uh, on so-and-so date. However, I have left the office 
uh, you know, I have limited office on so, such and such date. If I'm just imagining, I'm putting across a hypothetical situation. In other cases where the person is an individual and has drawn that check which was dishonored, then you may indicate in your reply, if you have no legally uh, uh, outstanding liability or debt towards that person. Sometimes it happens, you had given a, that's a standard defense on all uh, 138 cases that it was issued as a security. Now a security check, every check, even the courts have recently said every check in India is issued for security purposes only. That's a typical defense which is not sometimes well taken by the courts because almost all the accused in 138 cases use that defense that this was issued as a security purpose. It was not in discharge of a uh, legally enforceable debt. So for security purposes, suppose somebody has um, taken some loan from uh, a particular person in cash. Then as a security, the lend money lender takes some checks from you for, for that amount. And you have your terms either orally or in writing that upon receiving of the loan amount, you will return those checks. Now, sometimes it happens those checks are misused or checks are stolen, whatever, anything can happen. You may have a signed checkbook, though that's not a good idea. That's why it is said that it should be in lock and key. There may be many number of situations, but you have received this notice. Now, there may be a situation your checkbook was stolen. You may indicate you have no liability. This checkbook was stolen and I filed a complaint uh, in case you still, uh, your client, because you will be replying to a lawyer who has served with the demand notice in case your client still persists with, you know, goes ahead with filing a complaint, same shall be at his risk, cost, consequences, and whatever. But in other cases, especially when you have no liability towards the person who has served your notice of demand, or a person is serving your notice of demand on the basis of a check which was misused, you may reply in your uh, notice itself. Because later on what happens, that person will in any case file a complaint under 138. Once you enter appearance, once you are summoned, the court may ask you, since a notice of demand was served to you, because the person, the, the complainant will have to demonstrate before the court because it's a compulsory uh, requirement that notice of demand has to be served within 30 days. They will have annexed with the, their complaint the copy of the notice as well as the tracking report that was delivered to you. So the court may ask you when you were served a legal notice, you chose not to reply. So not replying is not a good idea, but you may put it across, especially in cases where there is no liability. If there is liability, it's always a wise idea to pay or to tell them that, you know, I will be repaying it. Please give me some more time. Whatever the terms may be, you have be you may be having with that person who has served you the notice of demand. If you are liable to pay, please pay the amount. If you are not liable to pay, in those situations, typically, we draft a reply to that 138 notice indicating in particular that, look, this is the situation and these are the reasons why I'm not liable to pay you this amount, which you have claimed in your notice of demand and your notice of demand is misconceived or uh, this check was issued for an amount which I had already paid you in cash or we, which was set off by some other way. If you have business relations, you may have set it off against some other thing. You may indicate it in your reply. So this reply under 138 is, is very subjective uh, depending on the facts of each case. But uh, you will have to indicate clearly as to how, if you have no liability towards the person who has served you notice of demand, uh, that how you don't have any such liability and how that notice of demand is uh, misconceived. And then you finally pray that you uh, direct the person that you withdraw this notice. And if you still uh, choose to proceed on the basis of these wrong facts, you will contest them in the court of law. So that's how you put it. So any questions? Anyone has any question? I think almost yes, our time students. Is... If anyone has a question, please. Has any question for the notice under one thirty eight or reply to notice under one thirty eight? Reply, as I said, is uh, you know very subjective. But if you have no liability, please take care of it. How you have no liability, or if you have already repaid that amount by some other mode, by some bank transfer, by some cash you will have to indicate that, look, I have already paid you this amount. There's nothing outstanding. Or sometimes it happens that you are served a demand notice wherein the fact, is, whereas the fact is they owe you some money. So if you have a counterclaim, you put it across uh, accordingly that there is no outstanding liability. Instead, you owe me some money. So whatever the circumstances may be, please put it across in your reply. Yes, any questions? I hope there are no questions.
Sachin is saying something. He has put it in the chat box. Sir, if the reply is not satisfactory, then in how many days one? Okay. Yes, after 15. That's what I said. 30, 15, 30 rule. Please remember. 30 days after you receive communication of dishonor from your bank, you have 30 days to serve the demand notice to the uh, person concerned, seeking payment of that amount. Now that demand notice gives 15 days time as per law. That notice has to be for 15 days. Now, once they receive that notice of demand, they have 15 days to repay that amount. Now, after the expiry of 15 days, if you have not received the amount or if you have received, if you have not received the reply or satisfactory reply, you can file the case within next 30 days after those 15 days. So 30 days, 15 days, 30 days. So this all is there in 138 itself. You may go through section 138 of NIF. Yes, any other questions? I think there are no more questions. Very well. Thank you so much. Thank you for a patient listening. I think this was your last module or there's something more left in this course. Okay. Uh, one more module is left on uh, transnational contracts. It will be on 29. That's the last module. Very well. Yes. Very well. This is the second last module. Yeah. Very, very. Yes. Okay. So on the... All the best. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, Arushi. Okay. On that note, I would like to thank you, sir, on the behalf of FIMT School of Law. I would like to extend my sincerest gratitude for taking the time to deliver such an insightful and inspiring lecture. Thank you so much, sir. I would also express my gratitude to FIMT as well as Ms. Swati and you and uh, all those in the audience for giving me this opportunity to share my insights on these uh, you know, instruments of uh, law. Thank, Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Can I leave the meeting? Uh, yes, sir. You can. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening, sir.